so much for having me today. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm just going to share my screen really quick. Well, while you're sharing screen, everybody, be sure to mute yourself. Okay. Thank you. Do you all see that okay? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, uh, like I was introduced, uh, my name is Jesse. I am with the Bolsa Chica Conservancy. Um, I've been there for about four years, uh, currently acting as their senior restoration coordinator. Um, and I love what I do. How could you not working out uh, in such a beautiful place every day? Um, so today I'm gonna to be presenting on the history, restoration and some rarities of Bolsa Chica. So to start, I'll just kind of uh, give you a little intro to the location of Bolsa Chica in case you haven't been there before. I'm sure a lot of you have, um, it's pretty accessible and um, pretty, uh, pretty obvious when you see it. Um, so it's located on the Northern coast of Huntington Beach. Uh, here's a little map of it here. Um, it's around 1,449 acres in total. That is including the oil operations on the uh, southern end over here, southern and eastern end. Um, and it is uh, mostly made up of coastal sage scrub habitat. However, of course, it's mostly well known for being a wetland. Um, it's actually the largest salt marsh between um, the Tijuana River estuary and Monterey Bay. So that, well, it sounds like it's, uh, it, it's huge and it is pretty large. Um, it just kind of speaks more toward, to the um, degradation of salt marshes along Southern California, unfortunately. Um, today, I'll start off by talking about the history of Bolsa Chica um, and kind of covering the topics you can see there on screen. Um, but before I start with that, I just do want to make, um, you know, recognize that we are on, well, in Bolsa Chica, we are on Tongva and Ahashiman land. Um, and this area is still very culturally important to those people. So uh, starting off with a little bit of uh, the geological formation of Bolsa Chica, it all started with uplift, I guess. Um, the coast of California as we know it has changed due to uplift. Um, hope you enjoy the little uh, stock image I found there. Um, and then what about Bolsa Chica itself? Um, if you visit Bolsa Chica, you'll notice that it's different from the um, sort of surrounding areas because it has actually two benches present on the mesa. So um, this image was actually taken from the lower bench um, facing the upper bench where there are now houses. Um, you can see the, um, the escarpment, uh, sort of like the steep edge there. Uh, in the picture. Um, now this was formed by the Newport Inglewood fault, um, where it's thought to have, just as the fault is moved, it's sort of set up that higher bench um, and then erosion has occurred and kind of formed what separates this area so clearly from the Huntington Beach Mesa, just south of it. Now, also a big part of uh, Bolsa Chica and separating it from the Huntington Beach Mesa is um, the Santa Ana River, which no longer present in that area. Um, around 15 to 25,000 years ago, um, the Santa Ana River was meandering closer to Bolsa Chica and separated what is now the Huntington Beach Mesa and the Bolsa Chica Mesa. <clears throat> Now, starting with the pre-colonial human history of Bolsa Chica, so, or starting off with Southern California rather, um, there's first records of humans in Southern California starting at least 9,000 years ago based off of archeological evidence. Um, it probably extends past that, but that's what it's estimated at currently. Um, however, in Bolsa Chica, it's kind of unclear. Um, it likely humans have existed there um, for around 8,000 years, um, according to the oldest artifacts found in the area. However, um, talking about those artifacts, it's kind of difficult. It's an unclear record. Um, so because of flooding in the area, it does 
or used to at least, um, you know, ex experience regular flooding, um, but also native peoples removed from that area. And then the archeological sites there were degraded over time by humans, um, Westerners, mostly through agriculture, oil extraction, um, defense construction during World War II, um, current urbanization, and even theft by amateur artifact collectors. That was like a pretty serious problem. Um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of disheartening to hear about that, but uh, it really disrupted the context of the artifacts that are currently there. So archeologists, archeologists when they're looking at that site now kind of can't get a good idea of um, the context of those, those items. Now, if you've heard anything about the archaeology of Bolsa Chica, you've probably heard of cogstones. Um, so these are made from a variety of stone types, ranging from you know soft sand, uh, sand soft mudstone or sandstone to granite even. Um, and they're actually not known to have been produced after 3,500 BCE, uh, which is interesting. So they, um, long long time ago were uh, formed and they're found throughout Southern California, but the vast majority of known cogstones were found within one site at Bolsa Chica. Um, and it has led to speculation that they are actually formed in Bolsa Chica, they were constructed there. Um, and it's not really known what they were used for. Um, they don't show any signs of wear, so it likely wasn't anything utilitarian, nothing like grinding grain or anything like that. Um, there are some, you know, speculated uses. I read that they may have been used as um, mapping stars overhead or maybe as a game or something like that. Um, but because, again, the archaeological context of this area has been disrupted, it's hard for people to um, study it and really get a good idea of what they were used for. Um, but there's likely a lot more in Bolsa Chica that haven't been identified. And there's probably a lot that have been um, taken from the area that haven't been you know, recorded. Continuing on to um, pre-colonial human history again, um, we have the Tongva and Hashimin people. Um, again, this area is and was very culturally important to these people. Um, both groups are recognized to be the last known Native American inhabitants of Bolsa Chica. Um, the actual territories are interesting. Um, uh, they overlap a bit here, as you can see, um, the Gabrieleno, also known as Tongva uh, territory, is outlined with this bolded border, and the Wanyeño, also known as Ahashiman, um, are highlighted in yellow. Um, so most likely, historically, uh, the Tongva used the area more often. However, uh, Ahashiman have an important use of that area as well. Um, now that's actually pretty important because whenever we do anything um, in a site new at Bolsa Chica, uh, whether it be restoration or um, doing some surveying, if it's not a site that was previously cleared um, or in that area that was previously cleared, we need to have uh, members of both tribes be present. Um, it's very important to get them involved, obviously, with their ancestral lands whenever we're working there. And now the un, uh, unhappy topic of colonization. Um, it's hard to ignore when talking about Bolsa Chica just because it was pretty prevalent. Um, so the closest mission to Bolsa Chica is the San Gabriel mission. Um, it actually, the full range of it didn't reach Bolsa Chica. I think the, the range is around 20 mile radius around. Um, so Bolsa Chica wasn't actually right there but the Tongva people around that area were, and of course they were impacted. Um, so this uh, mission was established in 770, 1771. However, a permanent, con a permanent stone structure wasn't really began construction until 1790. Um, and of course the majority of labor com was completed by Native Americans, um, the Tongva. Uh, supposedly, it started out as um, sort of labor for trade, um, but we all know that the conditions worsened, at least after that. 
Um, the missions created uh, or created in what was called the Alta California area, which is now just called California. Um, and they were only supposed to last 10 years. However, uh, the San Gabriel mission was well-placed and soon became an economically successful and politically influential area. In 1883, um, uh, there was a forced secularization of the missions in uh, California uh, by the Mexican government. Um, and while you might think that that could have been a positive thing for people that necessarily didn't want to live in that situation, um, once Native Americans that were living there and working there um, after the secularization, they didn't have a place to live. Their culture wasn't as intact um, and they didn't have any right to their ancestral land. Um, continuing on with history, we go into the land grants and the ranchos period. So in um, 1786, uh, around 1600, uh, 100, 1606, uh, I can't talk, um, acres of land were granted to Corporal Manuel Nieto um, for ranching. Uh, in 1834, uh, Nieto divided his ranch between his, um, or the, his ranch was divided and sort of passed on to his ancestors, uh, 33,460 of acres of which were inherited by Caterina Ruiz. Um, and she named her area Rancho Las Bolsas, um, kind of queuing into the, the Bolsa Chica name there. Um, in 1841, uh, she sold 8,100 acres of that land to her brother, Joaquin Ruiz, who um, named his area Rancho La Bolsa Chica. And that is where we get the name Bolsa Chica. Um, I believe it was named after the sort of bay running through. He thought it looked like a, a pocket or a purse. Um, and then in 1861, uh, 34,000 acres of land, including Rancho La Bolsa Chica, was sold to um, Abel Stearns. He's, I mean, kind of a uh, famous name out there for anyone in uh, LA. I'm not a huge history buff myself, but I know that he was involved with sort of setting up uh, the LA area as we know it. Um, Next up, uh, we go into the Bolsa Chica Gun Club. So in 1899, uh, 1,160 acres of marsh at Bolsa Chica were purchased by the Bolsa Land Company from Stearns. Um, uh, he eventually was dividing and gradually selling off land, mostly to farmers. Um, however, the portion of the land that the Bolsa Chica land company purchased was marshland, which was not selling very well because it's wet, it wasn't great for farming. Um, and at that time, land like that was oftentimes considered worthless to farmers and to people. Um, now, the Bolsa Chica company, land company set up the Bolsa Chica Gun Club, uh, who shortly thereafter built their kind of, uh, headquarters here. You can kind of see it uh, on the picture over here. Um, and they used the area for hunting, mostly ducks. Um, and in order to be able to hunt a little bit better, they constructed a dam to close off the southern portion of Olsa Chica from tidewaters. Um, and then this obviously um, impacted the area pretty intensely. Uh, it shifted the southern portion of the reserve from estuarine conditions to freshwater ponds, and then also um, seasonal saltwater ponds and salt flats, uh, which are still present in that area today. You can see them, um, although the seasonality is aided sort of by pumped water nowadays. Um, but also when they did this, it had the uh, unforeseen consequence of causing some flooding to nearby farms. Um, just because silt, uh, sand and silt ended up building up at the original inlet to Bolsa Chica, which is, uh, was at that point on the corner of Warner and PCH. Uh, now that inlet goes to the harbor in Huntington Beach um, in a similar area, but it's more channelized now. Um, the dam itself 
was damaged by the 1933 earthquake um, and was eventually replaced in 1959 by the Orange County Flood Control District. Um, and if you visit the reserve, you can actually see uh, what was the dam. Um, we call it the tide gates now. Um, if you ever see like our little maps, it's called the tide gates. If you're driving along PCH, you can see them. Uh, but it just uh, it kind of looks like a road as you're driving along PCH. Um, this leads into the oil extraction era. So in uh, 1920, um, drilling begins in Huntington Beach by, Stan the, by the Standard Oil Company. Um, they first started on the Huntington Beach Mesa. Um, and then in November 6th of 1920, they actually started beginning to, uh, they did a test drill at the, um, on the Bolsa Chica Gun Club's property, also on the Huntington Beach Mesa. Um, now, when this happened, uh, it resulted in a massive gush of oil, actually, that released what I read as 20,000 barrels worth of oil within 24 hours, which covered the ground and the wetlands below. I can't even, we just had an oil spill not that long ago, and just like thinking about that and amount of oil going directly into the wetlands is really scary. <laughs> um, and it's it just kind of insane. Um, so in 1940, Signal Oil and a uh, gas company was award, awarded a lease to install 22 wells on the 110 acres of the Bolsa Chica wetlands. Um, now this picture isn't of the wetlands themselves, but it kind of shows you a picture of Huntington Beach during that era. Um, it was kind of known just for orange trees and um, oil extraction and and it's kind of funny seeing that many people on the beach with um, oil being extracted right next to it. It's, it's kind of funny uh, in a depressing way, I guess. Um, the mineral rights to Bolsa Chica after this changed hands quite a few times. Um, currently operations, there are operations at Bolsa Chica. If you've seen it, if you visited, um, that's being operated by California Resources Corporation. Um, and fortunately they, work pretty closely with CDFW, um, being as they're on an ecological reserve. Um, and they, they're they pretty good. Uh, I mean, of course, it's oil operations, so it's maybe not ideal, but they do a, a pretty good job with um, working with the different organizations there um, and keeping things uh, as safe as possible. Um, and while the oil operations, at this time especially in Bolsa Chica, without a doubt um, negatively impacted the wetlands in part due to construction of that network of roads that you can still see on the Southern end of the reserve, um, just so the equipment could get in and out of the area. The existence of the oil operations, um, oddly enough, may have delayed the urban development of the area and um, has sort of inadvertently led to it being protected. So um, at, it's hard to also mention Bolsa Chico without mentioning some of the um, uh, activities that happened there during World War II. Uh, so in 1941, um, 600 acres of the land was acquired by the US Army from the Bolsa Chico Gun Club. It was a temporary um, uh, sort of grab of land um, for what at that time was expected to be um, invasion from uh, Japanese uh, forces across the Pacific. Of course, that didn't happen, um, but they did uh, mount guns um, on these Panama mounts uh, on the reserve. The guns are gone, but you can still see the Panama mounts as you're walking the trails. Um, it's kind of cool to see. Um, it's definitely a feature that a lot of people geek out on. Um, this kind of gets into starting uh, Bolsa Chica being at risk for more than just oil operations, damage from that. So in the 70s, uh, or 1970 specifically, uh, Signal Oil and Gas purchased uh, Bolsa Chica from the Gun Club, and they intended to convert the wetlands into a marina. <clears throat> After lengthy uh, negotiations with uh, State Lands Commission regarding land ownership and and um, rights, <clears throat> uh, there was an agreement 
um, in 1973, they, uh, the state gained ownership of 300 acres of land. Um, and of the 300 acres, 210 were restored. Um, that was completed in 1978. Um, also at that time, uh, the flat gates in the dam were permanently opened, which allowed tidewater to reach uh, the southern portions of Bolsa Chica uh, to an extent, not, not all of it. It's sort of um, blocked off in some interesting ways. Also at this time is when grassroots efforts started to take hold because of that plan to install the marina. However, it isn't for reasons that you may have suspected. Um, it wasn't necessarily out of concern for um, the environment there. Um, at first, it was concern over the potential uh, marina's impact on infrastructure in the area, anything from schools to just traffic in the area. Um, <clears throat> and I believe that was a big concern for people because not that long ago at that time, Marina Del Rey was put in and um, people kind of saw how that affected that area. Um, and it was sort of top of mind. Um, continuing on from there in 1976, uh, the Amigo de, Amigos de Bolsa Chica formed to oppose the signal, signal um, oil and gas company's Marina plan. Um, in 1979, the Amigos uh, filed a lawsuit against Signal Oil and Gas and several California agencies. <clears throat> um, and it was sort of, it, it came back, it, it didn't kind of go through, but they did end up refiling their lawsuit in 1987. <clears throat> the, uh, afterwards, the Bolsa Chica land use plan and habitat Habitat con the conservation plan um, was sort of being discussed. It was two um, plans that didn't exactly agree. Uh, There's a lot of contention between them actually. Um, the Coastal Conservancy Plan, um, which is the HCP, proposed that the restoration, there'd be restoration of 951 acres of wetlands, while the uh, LUP, the <clears throat> local uh, plan, proposed for 621 acres of restoration. So quite a big difference there. Um, in 1988, there was actually a coalition formed to sort of try and reach an agreement to what was happening to this land. Um, it was between the Amigos, uh, Signal Oil and Gas, the State's Land Commission, Orange County, and the city of Huntington Beach. Um, and actually the coalition, um, uh, is what led to my organization, the organization I work for uh, being um, put into place um, in 1990, uh, mostly just to run an interpretive center for education um, at the Northern parking lot of the reserve. Um, we still, well, actually <clears throat> right now we don't have the interpretive center. I'll get into that a little bit later, um, but we still do educational activities, but also restoration on the reserve. Now, the coalition um, concept plan itself would have resulted in the elimination of the marina plan, but the filling of 120 acres of wetlands. And that was one of the things that it caused sort of a, a rift in the Amigos. Um, and it ended up leading to the formation of the Bolsa Chica Land Trust at that time. So uh, it, not to get too into like the drama of everything, um, it, at that time, it really was what a lot of the Amigos saw as the best chance at protecting as much of the wetlands as possible. Um, but of course, <clears throat> when you're talking about such an important area, it's going to um, cause quite a lot of drama. People are going to want to protect more, of course. Um, so, uh, formed from an offshoot, I believe, of the Amigos, um, the Bolsa Chica Land Trust was formed to try and protect the rest of the Mesa as well. So in 1996, the Bolsa Chica Land Trust, the Huntington Beach Tomorrow, uh, Shoshone Gabrielino Nation, the Sierra Club, and the Surfrider Foundation filed a mass lawsuit against pretty much anyone involved with owning any portion of land or wanting to develop any portion of land in Bolsa Chica and it succeeded in sending the LCP, LCP back to the Coastal Commission for reconsideration. And during that time, it actually sort of acted as a really, really nice delay. Um, the Coastal Commission kind of 
switched their tone on some things and it actually leaded to a uh, signal to eventually sell all of their lowland and lower bench properties to the state. <clears throat> um, continuing on. So uh, now we get into some of the restoration. So um, here's just a little kind of overview of what uh, some things I'll be covering. But in uh, 2005, the full title basin, well, actually, before all this, there was tons and tons and tons of paperwork. Um, uh, so much uh, planning and paperwork was behind all this. I'm going to ignore that. I'm not a big uh, like legal person. I don't know the, the jargon so well. But in 2005, um, the full tidal basin started to be constructed. Um, it was mostly done with sort of uh, dry land work, heavy equipment. Um, they needed to convert an area that was mostly flat to be able to handle tides that would be six to eight feet in that area. So they had to make quite a lot of room to prevent any flooding. Um, in total, 367 acres uh, were contoured to form that basin. <clears throat> Also in 2006 um, was the construction of an inlet and jetty. Now this is probably one of the most notable things. If uh, you saw the area change in that time, it, I, I just heard an anecdote of it, but even after that inlet was installed, people started noticing so many more migratory birds stopping in that area and using it for, um, as a stopping ground for hunting on their, on their journey along the flyway but also started to, starting to nest more in those areas, <clears throat> which kind of brings you into the nest sites. So uh, CDFW um, maintains and manages the nest sites in this area. And actually the nest sites that they are mostly maintaining are of shorebirds that normally would nest on beaches. Um, now this area isn't naturally, doesn't naturally have large areas of beaches. That's all across the street at Bolsa Chica State Beach, um, which there's nest sites there as well, but it's, it's hard to protect nest sites on a beach because people love to walk around on them. And the, the eggs of these bird species, the California least tern and the Western snowy plover look so much like rocks. They, and they just kind of make little scrapings in the ground and lay their eggs right there. Um, so when people are walking around, it's disturbing the nesting, but also you may step on the eggs inadvertently. You might not even notice them. <clears throat> so a lot of work is actually being done to clear areas of vegetation on the reserve to provide suitable nesting habitat for these bird species. Um, mostly this is uh, done by uh, CDFW. However, each of the organizations on the reserve does have a, a hand in helping out with this. Uh, the organization I work for, the Conservancy, the Amigos, and the Land Trust all help um, to work on this. The organization I work with does also has a monitoring program for these areas called EONS or Eyes on Nest Sites that happens every year. Um, and if you want to find more about that, it's on our, our website if you want to get involved that way. Um, also, there's a lot of lower bench restoration that has happened and is still happening. Um, so a lot of that is, most of the lower bench restoration is being conducted, I believe, by the land trust. They have a, a large area um, on the lower bench. The Conservancy also does do some restoration there as well, um, sort of closer to um, the, the bridge that goes across and along Warner Pond, <clears throat> which is along Warner Avenue. Um, and there's also some low bench restoration. Um, so, I, one of my main projects actually works on a low land area, um, salt marsh area on the reserve called Rabbit Island, and I'll get into that um, more in detail in a little bit. Uh, so here's just a little map kind of showing um, the areas that I was talking about. So we have, let's see, the, the full title lowland restoration. So there's that basin I was talking about. There's 367 acres that were um, excavated to form that basin. So when the inlet was opened, the water had somewhere to fill in um, and, and go without causing any flooding, um, provided a, a lot of habitat as well. Um, just uh, kind of the general areas. I'll be talking about, uh, one of the areas I'll be talking about that I do restoration work in 
is Rabbit Island, uh, which is in the full tidal basin. Um, it is kind of right here, um, hard to see uh, in this map, but I'll show you a little bit more uh, coming up. Um, now also, uh, I'm going to be talking about a restoration area that isn't actually in Bolsa Chica, but I want to mention it because I, I work on it a lot. Um, yeah, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, in Harriet Weeder over here. You're not on the microphone, are you? No. So, um, ba -ba -ba. No. Aaron and Carol, you may want to mute. <laughs> So the Bolsa Chica Conservancy conducts general restoration activities throughout the reserve. Um, but like I said, today I'm gonna be focusing on Harriet Reed Regional Park and Rabbit Island. Um, so our Harriet Reed Regional Park project is um, actually located just south of the ecological reserve and is a part of the Greater Huntington Beach Mesa. Um, our restoration activities at this site are in collaboration with OC Parks and the Orange County Transportation Authority um, in order to fulfill a portion of the general development plan for the park, as well as mitigation for an area of impact, impacted land <clears throat> that contains Southern tar plant, uh, Centromardia perii subspecies australis. The restoration site is a, a nine and a half acre plot on the regional park uh, that upon the start of the project was in pretty rough shape. Um, over 90% of all the plant cover was actually non-native species at that time. Um, also, uh, I'll be covering Rabbit Island. Um, so during low tide, the island is around 52 acres in total and consists of mudflat, salt marsh, and four dune coastal strand habitat. Um, this site is actually one of the, on the southern half of the reserve that was reopened with that um, uh, inlet um, and also with the, the, in the full tidal basin. Um, to start, the island is pretty unique. Um, and it's actually home to large patches of shore grass and salt grass, as well as home to um, a couple of rare species itself. <clears throat> On this slide, we, uh, we have a chart depicting the change of plant cover at our Hare Eater Regional Park project. The data used in this chart started in 2018, almost a year after we started um, our restoration activities at the site. At that point, we were still irrigating the site. And as you can see, we were dealing with 75% non-native plant cover at the time of that year's survey. Um, currently, cover at this site stands at 61% native cover and 14% non-native cover. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed, uh, we did lose almost 10% native plant cover between the 2020 and 2021 surveys, but this can likely be att attributed to um, poor rainfall as I'm sure all of you uh, are aware of, um, we actually observed up to six inches of dieback on some of our native plants, uh, namely on our sagebrush artemisia on that site. Um, here we have a photo from, I believe, uh, 2018, which depicts surveying efforts at the Harriet Weeder project. Um, along with staff, we were very fortunate to have had a lot of help from interns and volunteers. Um, in this picture, we have a, a couple of our interns in that site, a volunteer, um, and then his kind of backs turned to the camera. But that's Dave Pryor. They're bent down. I'm sure some of you know him. He's a huge mentor on this project and helps us out quite a bit. Um, next up, we have a map of a large portion of Rabbit Island. Um, this depicts the change of cover of Carborotus edgeless at the site since 2018. While not illustrated in this map, um, there is record from CDFW of this island being almost completely covered by the, that species before the restoration activities began. Um, the Conservancy took over the lead role in restoration of Rabbit Island back in 2018. Um, and uh, yeah, our access season is pretty small. Um, it's only, we only are allowed to be there uh, when there's not nesting bird species. This site in particular is a, a favored nesting site for the building Savannah Sparrow, as there's a lot of pickleweed. Um, it's one of its favored plants for nesting. Um, next up, we have a picture that highlights, again, the importance of volunteer help to our organization and pretty much every on the ground environmental nonprofit. 
um, I have really no doubt that uh, we wouldn't have made anywhere near the dent in the population of this species as we have without their help. Um, and it's a constant, constant effort. It, it's a pretty fast growing plant um, and really does a good job at smothering out um, a lot of sensitive species. One of which I'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, I'm just gonna cover some of our, our rare species um, that I work with uh, personally. Uh, starting off with Southern tar plant, Centromadiae uh, perii subspecies australis. <clears throat> Uh, this is an annual species in the aster family, and it's uh, classified as a 1v1 plant under the California rare plant raking system. Um, this species can actually be very easily seen from the publicly accessible areas of the ecological reserve and at uh, Harriet Weeder Regional Park. Overall, it's also present along the coast from Santa Barbara County down into Baja, California. Um, this species depends on disturbance to persist long term, <clears throat> namely through seasonal flooding or pooling events, um, leading again to it being a rare species. Those things don't happen so often anymore. Um, the plant itself has reddish brown stems and at maturity it has small spine tipped leaves and head inflorescences that usually have at least 13 ray flowers. <clears throat> As a part of our monitoring efforts, we also um, conduct full annual counts for this species at Harriet Weeder. Um, the baseline count for this species in 2016 resulted in no occurrences at the site. Um, and as you can see, the 2019 survey depicts a relative abundance of this species. <clears throat> While exciting, this was due to a high amount of disturbance being created by the filling of an abandoned geological survey trench on the, the project site. As with um, the general native plant coverage of the site, the population of Centromadia did fall, uh, likely due to a lack of rain. Next up, I'm going to be talking about coast woolly heads, uh, Nemocollis denudata var denudata. Um, this species belongs to the buckwheat family, Polygonaceae, and um, it, this variety of the species is classified as a 1b2 plant, and is at risk likely due to loss of um, and degradation of its preferred habitat, um, which is open sandy areas. Um, so at Bolsa Chica, <clears throat> this species can be preserved, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, can be observed by the public uh, next to trails. It runs, uh, that, those trails in particular, they run across PCH, it's our kind of sand dune trails. <clears throat> Um, this species itself gets its name from the woolly uh, blooms and fruits uh, produces along its prostrate inflorescences. And the leaves of this species are held in a basal rosette, um, have a fairly corrugated texture, and also are covered in woolly trichomes. Um, populations of Nemocollis denudata var denudata are particularly at risk for being outcompeted by larger invasive species, namely ice plants. Um, like the Carpobrotus I was talking about. So this map I have here um, is from 2018, and it depicts uh, competing populations of Nemocollis and Carpobrotus at Rabbit Island. After removal of Carpobrotus from these areas, um, we then will go along and spread the seeds of Nemocollis in an effort to uh, bolster its population. The last species I'm going to be talking about um, is going to be Soida estroa, or estuary sea blight. Um, because taxonomy changes a lot, this is uh, now an Amaranthaceae, but historically it's been in Kenopodiaceae. Um, and it's classified as a 1b2 species by the CRPR system. Sueda esteroa is found along the coast from Santa Barbara County into Baja. Um, and this species mostly occurs in coastal salt marshes, being most salt marshes in coastal Southern California have been developed over or degraded it's easy to understand how the species is at risk. In Bolsa Chica, I have seen the largest population of the species at Rabbit Island. Um, and while it's considered a rare species, it actually had around 5% cover of the island during our baseline surveys, um, which for a rare species, that's, that's pretty exciting. <clears throat> um, 
So next on our agenda, the Conservancy is uh, working on a cordgrass pilot study at Rabbit Island. Uh, we are currently um, secure. Oh, actually, we have secured the, the collection site for our transplants, and uh, we're going to be working with Tidal Influence to uh, gather those. Um, eventually, we'll be dividing them into 500 plugs <clears throat> that we will then um, install at some uh, pilot sites at Rabbit Island, mostly on the northern end of the island. Um, this is all done in um, as a part of one of our projects to sort of increase the habitat suitability here for uh, light-footed ridgeways rails, um, also being an endangered species. Um, included in that project was actually the installation of five nesting graphs on the reserve, um, which are kind of funny looking little uh, palm covered huts that you can see when you're walking around. Um, also, the Conservancy is interested in pursuing a reintroduction project for Chloropyron meridimum meridimum at the Ecological Reserve um, or Salt Marsh Bird's Beak. <clears throat> uh, Rabbit Island was surveyed in the past by tidal influence for reintroduction of the species due to it having a large amount of salt grass, which is a, a favored host plant. It's a, a, it's a hemiparasite. Um, so it might be a good really a uh, good location for this species and um, I'm actually working with them to set up another meeting to see um, if there's any sort of suitable sites to, to work on together in the future. Also, the Conservancy is eager to start um, restoration activities on a 22 acre portion of our property adjacent to the ecological reserve and Harriet Weeder. However, we are currently in the permitting process for that land. So restoration activities um, won't be able to begin for a while. Um, thank you for bearing with me during this presentation. Um, I would like to thank, at the very least, the, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, OC Parks, and <clears throat> the help of our many volunteers um, with our projects. It's, it's really, um, I can't say enough about how much they've helped us. Um, if you would like to get involved with our regular bi-monthly restoration events, please visit the events page of our website. Uh, the link, uh, the web link is here up above. Um, and if you'd like to get more information um, on anything I've talked about or to help out with a specific project or discuss collaboration, um, please reach, at me, uh, reach out to me using the email address below. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Jesse. That was a, a great talk and a very interesting place with a lot of rich history. Um, so at this point, if anybody wants to uh, uh, mute themselves and ask any questions, I'll also look at the chat. Um, oh, here's a, a comment. Uh, Jesse, you mentioned contouring as the start of restoration. So that suggests that the site was so degraded that a fresh start was needed. Uh, are the native species from the seed bank or cultivated? Um, so those were spread, I believe. So there is some from the seed bank. However, um, that work was consulted out. Uh, the name of the firm is slipping my mind, um, but they did spread seed in that area. Okay. Um, is there a plan to take climate change driven sea level rise into account? Yes. Um, so this actually relates to one of the other organizations on the reserve, the Land Trust. I know that they are doing a study on um, adapting one of the nest sites that they work on um, to um, sort of exist for a sea level rise. Um, it's one of the turn islands on the reserve. Um, I don't have a ton of information on that. Um, there may be inf more information on their website, um, or you might be able to reach out to them to get some more information about that. Um, let's see. Uh, we had 41 participants at one point, actually with 44. <coughs> Good turnout for the beginning of the year. Good way to start the year. If anybody that's on the call wants to uh, unmute themselves, um, feel free and, and uh, share your comments. Uh, if anybody's been there and seen anything interesting, oh, actually, what happened? Um, I, 
pardon me if I missed it, but what happened with the drone accident? Uh, has there been recovery after that? Yes. So, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, um, there was a couple of drone incidents actually on the ecological reserve, one of which, um, or probably both of which might have led to the abandonment of, I can't even remember, like uh, hundreds of elegant turn nests um, that was actually on that nesting island I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, and they did have eggs present, so thousands of um, eggs were abandoned. Um, I believe those terns ended up moving into the LA Harbor, um, uh, the somewhere. Uh, I don't know if they nested again, though. Okay. Uh, there's a comment in the chat saying, can you speak more about the recent oil spills and how they affected Pulse <laughs> So very fortunately, we weren't um, impacted too much by the recent oil spills. They, most of that oil seems to have shifted um, because of the current south and very unfortunately affected some other marshes, um, particularly the Talbert Marsh in Huntington Beach. Um, so we were fortunately spared against the brunt of the damages from the spill. Um, however, of course, oiled birds do make their way into um, the reserve. And I know um, employees and volunteers with um, all of the organizations here were kind of on lookout for those. And we would, um, if we did see anything, we would report that to the reserve manager. Um, uh, but as far as the work being done on that, it was mostly um, other organizations. Um, I know that uh, Wetlands and Wildlife Care Center was uh, working on that as well as International Bird Rescue. Okay. Um, all right. So there was also a comment about the recent sewer spill there. Yes. Uh, so those happened. People are just dumping everything there, huh? There's yeah. There's well, there's one of the the big problems as far as that is that one of the inlets into the reserve <clears throat> is the Huntington Beach Harbor. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the one that um, was mentioned, but there was a sewage spill um, caused by a boat uh, in the harbor. Um, I'm not sure what was kind of going on, but um, they were, I think, draining the, the septic and there was an incident and it drained into the ocean instead uh, into, and it, and it made its way into the wetlands. Um, I don't know uh, how those necessarily impacted uh, the wetlands. Um, those are sort of more long-term things that you would see. It adjusts, it affects the nutrients um, available there. Um, but from what I've heard, nothing major has been um, shown so far. Okay, um, so Karen says the Dominguez Channel sewer spill, did it impact the wetlands? Ah, uh, yeah, I um, unfortunately am not super aware of that at the moment. Um, I can reach out to our reserve manager if you would like to jot down my email um, and contact me, I will uh, forward any information I find. Okay. <clears throat> That person could uh, uh, send it in the chat. Um, here we go. Um, uh, Dory says, for those on Facebook resources uh, that she'd like to point to, uh, there's a hidden Huntington Beach Facebook page. And um, uh, historian Chris Eating for interesting historical impulse <laughs> chica. So that's in the uh, chat for anyone who wants to look at that. Yes, he's a he's a really a great resource, Chris Epting. Um, we did a talk with him. We every now and then we do a, a talk with him um, through our expert talk series, um, and I think those are available online somewhere as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, uh, "Is there any?" A couple of people comment about the drone accidents. Is there any uh, thing? being done to discourage people from flying drones over the preserve? Yeah, um, well, so part of part of that is- Environmentalists that, with shotguns. What was that? I said, other than environmentalists with shotguns. 
right? Um, <clears throat> so the the drone incidents, we every now and then get drones, but it was particularly bad during the past two years just because we've had so many more visitors, which is partially a good thing because it's more people getting interested in the outdoors and the environment around them. But unfortunately, it also means more reserve violations. Um, and as far as what's being done to sort of discourage drone use is we're trying to let as many people know um, that if you do see a reserve violation, especially something like that, that you want to re report that to Caltip. Um, there's a, a, an app, they also have a phone number that you can contact anytime you see a reserve violation. Um, and then the more sort of contacts they get about that, the more likely they are to send warden out to um, investigate, but especially if they get a, a tip about a drone, especially since that's such a present topic um, on the reserve, that's more likely to get a warden sent out. Um, but I think we are getting, we're having more uh, warden surveillance of the area now after that, which is great. Um, and then I think there's also a, a, a collaboration between the different groups to try and get some more um, eyes out there as well. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, all right, so um, there's uh, interest in our chapter uh, about doing a field trip to uh, Balsa Chica. Uh, would you be the person, well, can you uh, maybe get in touch with Brent or whoever got in touch with you and just uh, send us information about how we could do that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I believe I was in contact with Rosalie. Um, I'll, I'll contact her. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that would be something we can set up. Um, I know Melissa, the reserve manager, would love to be involved. I'll, I'll CC her in on that or I'll contact her, see if she will be able to do something. Okay. But um, I would love to, to help out with that. All right. We will have to wait until um, there's no need for me to tell COVID jokes anymore. But, <laughs> of course. Uh, for that to happen. Anyway. <laughs> Um, all right, um, let's see. I have a question. Please, go ahead. Okay, Jesse, I'm curious about your uh, special status species, the southern tar plant, plant woody, um, coast woolly heads, and suede esteron. Are these specifically salt marsh plants, or can, or can they handle drier conditions? Oh, great question. So... Only one of those species is um, salt marsh specific or estuary specific, even though that Bolsica is not really so much of an estuary anymore. And that's the Soweda, uh, the, um, okay. the sea blight that I mentioned. Um, the other species actually do prefer drier areas um, or seasonally dry anyways. So the Nemocollis, um, that one, uh, the, which is coast woolly heads, that prefers to live in sand dune areas. So it needs a very sandy soil. <clears throat> to occur and it, it really likes the disturbance that occur in, in sand dunes as well um, for re-sprouting. Um, and then with southern tar plant that does prefer dry areas um, to occur long term in a habitat, it does need disturbance, particularly through seasonal uh, pulling events. Um, but also if you kind of walk the areas, you notice it a lot along trails because there's sort of constant disturbance in those areas as well. Okay, so I'll get a hold of you through via email because I work in um, sand dune habitat specifically oh. um, in uh, the South Bay area, Redonda Beach, those kind of areas. And I'd be interested in working with you on reintroducing those two species that could live there. So I'll, I'll send you an email. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, we have some more questions here. Um, let's see. Um, what are your favorite specific spots around the reserve? Spots, aspects that are underappreciated. And if there's time, how, why specifically did the open inlet lead to much more bird nesting and activity? Yeah, so um, I'll start with, I guess, some of my favorite spots. Um, as far as the entire reserve, my favorite spot is Rabbit Island. However, that's not publicly accessible. You can see it from the trails, but you can't get there. Um, but really, I just enjoy walking the trail system. Um, you can see quite a lot, especially if you start from the southern parking lot. You cross the bridges going along 
that main trail, you see a lot of different bird species and then eventually it leads into a, a few different habitat types. Um, there's an area called the pocket pond. It's pretty interesting too. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, there's, there's so much to see. Also one of my favorite areas um, is actually you can't really see it from the trails in Bolsa Chica, but if you walk at Harriet Weeder, um, on there's a slope that goes down um, to that the edge the bottom edge of that mesa and you can see into the freshwater areas of the reserve um, which you can't see from the publicly accessible areas um, on the reserve itself which it's pretty interesting you see willow trees um, anamopsis just uh, and there's cattails everywhere too it's it's pretty interesting <clears throat> um, and then I think you also could you repeat the, the second question uh, the other part of it is um, how how and why did the open inlet lead to much more bird nesting and activity? Oh uh, yeah, so um, for starters, it converted that area from being um, closed off from the ocean, had no tidal uh, action. It was sort of freshwater ponds there, but when it was opened, it brought in um, well, it brought in fish. Um, as fish started to occur in that area, it was used more as it, well, it would have been used more as a, um, a nursery. That's one of the sort of like great things about wetlands, um, salt marshes specifically, is that they do function as um, nursery sites for different fish species. <laughs> and that provides a great foraging area for shorebirds um, and also wading birds. Wading birds aren't gonna be able to go out in the ocean um, is often, or if there's a salt marsh habitat where they can kind of wave, wade through the brush um, and feed on uh, different things living in the sediment and the, in the water. So I think it mostly had to do with what the, the water brought with it. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and if you bring them food, the birds are gonna come, huh? Mm -hmm. All right, um, okay, so, uh, Dory is going to share on her Facebook page a statement by Candace Brenner. Uh, oops, all right, stop sharing the screen. My um, my, my uh, chat moved. Anyway, oh sorry, no, that's all right. Um, so Dory's going to share on her uh, Facebook page a statement by Candace Brenner, a former faculty biologist, um, about the proposed disruptive trail to the sea adjacent to the flood control channel in the wetlands. Um, do you have any comments on that? Um, the, the trail, disruptive trail to the sea. I'm not sure exactly what this is talking about. Is it, um, I'll ask for clarification, I guess. Is this referring to the eventual Maybe, connection? Dory, can you unmute yourself and tell us more about it? Well, while Dory's unmuting herself, um, uh, there was another question. Um, somebody pointed out that uh, Madrona Marsh also has a southern tar plant along the trail. So hmm. at least there's somewhere else where there is a southern tar plant. Um, uh, let's see. John says, how much will enforcement of regulations be increased at the reserve. Many of us are concerned about the flouting of the regs that goes unaddressed. Well, yeah, that's kind of everywhere. Yeah. Um, I, I think one, one thing I will say is that, that uh, being involved here in the land conservancy, I think that, um, you know, as people get to know it better, I think that can help. And having people, you know, just point out that you know, even though to some people it look, might look like there's nothing there, there really is stuff there and, and just, you know, kind of point that out to people. So I think, you know, you can say it in a positive way, you know, there's, there's positive stuff out there, there there's, you know, that, that space is important for, for this habitat and, and ultimately it's important for us to, to keep it nice. But anyway, what's your thought? Absolutely. I, I agree. I think there's, a huge opportunity to educate people more because with this, what we saw with the increase in visitors, there's so many people that aren't used to going to these areas, especially in such an accessible area as Bolsa Chica is, it's right off PCH. 
Um, so as people are entering these areas that aren't used to them or don't really know sort of the ins and out, the rules, there are signs saying what you can and can't do. They are small sometimes and they're easy to ignore. And that does happen a lot. Um, I think it's it just comes down to us needing to do a better job in education. Yeah. So I know um, in at the, with the Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, we have uh, volunteer trail watch people. They're not law enforcement, but they typically uh, people that do that try to you know relatively gently you know educate people you know uh, not to do that. And and I think you know it's it's not going to stop everybody and everything, but I think it certainly cuts down on on a certain amount of vandalism, but more importantly, just people who don't know better, as you said. I mean, many of the people are not necessarily malicious, but they just don't really know any better and they don't really appreciate the value of the land. Mm -hmm. All right, so there are some more. Uh, did you have anything more to say about that? No, I think I think I covered it. Just okay. It lies um, in education. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Chris has found southern tar plant in empty lots in Wilmington industrial areas. Oh wow! So, goes to show what I said. Chris is awesome. Anyway, um, uh, Dee says thank you, Jesse, for this important work you're doing. Um, what else? Um, Oh, Tony says that uh, the White Point Nature Center in San Pedro uh, is going to have um, southern tar plant if they get a good rainfall. Um, nice. Yeah, so I think they collected, Tony must have collected seeds and planted it there. So, Fingers crossed on good rain. <laughs> yep. So we had uh, Johnny apple seed in the past. Now we have Tony native plant seed, um, you know, spreading native plants across uh, Southern California which is awesome. All right. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So um, Dory just says uh, that, you know, as far as the, the, the trail to the sea, um, that you should read the statement. I'm going to. I'm, I'm, okay. I think I might know what it's referring to, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely... I'm definitely gonna read up on it. It gives people something to look up on their own. And uh, so anybody who's interested in the disruptive trail to the sea, uh, look it up. Um, the person's, well, um, the person's name is Candace Brenner, C-A-N-D-A-C-E. And the last name is B-R-E-N-N-E-R. So, um, and next year when we have you back, uh, hopefully the issue will have been resolved and everything will be fine. Uh, does anybody else from the floor have any questions? Otherwise, I'll remind people before everybody signs out uh, this Saturday at nine o'clock in the morning, get there early. Uh, there'll be a, a Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy walk at um, McBride Trail in Palos Verdes. Beautiful, really, really excellent view of the ocean. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to get involved, uh, anybody in the audience that wants to get involved, even an Orange County person that wants to get involved in, in um, organizing a field trip to the Bolsa Chica wetlands, um, that'd be awesome. Just get in touch with me. So um, anybody else from the, from the audience? Thank you all. Thank you, Jesse. It was uh, very informative and um, so great work you're doing out there. It's a great place. I only recently was there. Um, my uh, Instagram uh, bird photographer friends are, seem to be there all the time. And yeah. <laughs> so, Sometimes um, I think I'm, I'm out there trying to um, get people to like, don't look at the bird, look at the plant down here. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, doesn't work most of the time, but. <laughs> well, you know, the important thing is uh, that, you know, Without the plants, the birds wouldn't be there. 